Welcome to Your Education Matters, now in our sixth year as a source of information about British Columbia education. Your Education Matters features the voices of professional educators and other education stakeholders. Today our guest is Jim Eicher of Burns Lake, first vice president of the BCTF and a career teacher in British Columbia. Jim Eicher received his undergraduate education at McMaster University in the social sciences. He went on to Dalhousie University for his bachelor's degree in education. Jim has had an extensive career in BC education as a primary teacher, a learning specialist, and a teacher counselor. Mr. Eicher also has served in many BCTF leadership roles at the local and provincial levels. He represented the union at the ministry's learning roundtable. Jim Eicher has been at the center of the action in a great number of BCTF, BCPSEA negotiations. He also has had a professional interest in issues such as poverty reduction and bullying. We are pleased to welcome BCTF First Vice President Jim Eicher to Your Education Matters. Thank you for thinking about Your Education Matters. Welcome, Jim. Hi, Paul. Thank you for having uh, me on your show. It's a privilege to be here. It's a pleasure here, too. I wanted to ask uh, you to start off today by giving us a kind of lay of the land, a global view of what you think is uh, happening today in British Columbia public schools and public education. What are some of the top issues from your point of view at BCTF as one of the table officers? Well, we know that uh, in our schools we have a lot of hard-working, uh, committed, dedicated teachers who are working uh, at their best to uh, meet the needs of uh, all of our students, the students that they teach right now, uh, despite some of the uh, learning and working conditions and lack of resources that our members are, are facing in, in the system. And we also know that we've got a lot of hard-working uh, uh, support staff, uh, also supporting our students and, and our teachers in the classroom, as well as parents who are supporting uh, their students, uh, their kids uh, at home. So, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what's happening and the work that we're doing, I think we're trying to uh, make the system uh, as best as it can be. And I think we have a, actually still have a high quality public education system because of the work uh, and the dedication of our members. Uh, in the past, I've interviewed some of the researchers from BCTF who talked about the work-life surveys that are done with teachers, and they indicated that uh, a feeling of not having the resources that they needed to do their job maximally to, to the greatest effect for their student was the number one problem with British Columbia teachers. Could you explore for us what kind of resources are missing or what uh, teachers are looking for to better do the job that they're there to do? Well, what we're looking for is um, smaller class sizes uh, for our students so we can give uh, each of our students uh, more individual attention. Uh, the more individual attention we can give to our students, uh, the better we're able to, uh, to meet their needs. Uh, we're looking for more resources to support our students in terms of learning specialist teachers. Uh, we know that uh, we've had a lot of uh, teacher counselors, learning assistance teachers, teacher librarians, English as a second language teachers who have been cut uh, from our schools and uh, these are support uh, teachers that support our students uh, within the classroom and outside uh, the classroom. So uh, you know, it would be so good to have a lot more of our uh, learning specialist teachers back in, uh, in the classroom uh, supporting our students as well as having more classroom uh, teachers. We know in the uh, last uh, decade uh, we've seen at least 1,500 of our learning specialist teachers cut out of the system and so that's uh, an important piece that we like to see back. We know that in the last decade we've seen um, uh, many of our uh, classrooms are, are oversized and uh, which means that teachers don't have the same time to uh, spend with each student that uh, we need to do. Well, to, to uh, look at it from the government's point of view, every uh, group that comes to government wants more resources. So how do you establish that, uh, the, the argument that uh, education, public schools should have a bigger slice of the pie than they're currently getting? Do you compare with other provinces? Do you compare 
with what BC did in the past? Well, we compare with what's happening uh, in other provinces across Canada, what's happened in uh, BC uh, in the past. Uh, we think that uh, public education is one of the uh, cornerstones of, of our uh, democracy. It's, uh, we're talking about our students, you know, the future of uh, British Columbia. And we think that government should put a high uh, priority in terms of um, providing the necessary funding and the resources. Uh, we know that, uh, according to Stats Canada uh, documents that were just recently released uh, using 2010-2011 figures, that uh, British Columbia has the worst student educator ratio in Canada. And, uh, you know, this student education ratio was much better in 2002 and we've seen uh, a decline that we've become worse in the province. So when we look at uh, funding, we know that um, British Columbia currently that uh, we spend approximately $1,000, about $988 less per student than uh, the average what happens across Canada. So, you know, so, so those are some of the comparators that we use. So uh, we know that we're spending less and there used to be a time that we actually uh, spent more. We know that in terms of the gross domestic product and how much is spent on, on K-12, to we can look back to uh, 2002 and we actually spent more um, money as, as a percentage of our GDP than uh, the rest of Canada. And now what we've seen is uh, in the last 10 years, we've actually have dropped to uh, ninth out of 10th mm -hmm. in terms of even spending on uh, K to 12. So, so those are some of the indicators and those are Stats Canada indicators uh, that we use. Well, you're not alone in this analysis. Uh, most of the other stakeholder groups, I think all of them, uh, see it pretty much the same way, that there's an underfunding of uh, maybe up to $300 million. Uh, only the ministry and the government argue the other side, as far as I know, but there, there probably are some other groups in the province who argue the other side, but they're not among the education stakeholder groups. I mean the parents, the trustees, the superintendents. <clears throat> all these groups seem to concur with the analysis you're giving. Uh, yes, and, it, and it's good to see that uh, the, you know, the analysis is, is concurred by the other uh, education uh, partners. And in fact, you know, if you actually look at the stats kind of figures, it's, uh, it's more like about $600 million that uh, <laughs> this government spends uh, uh, in terms of even just going to the national average. And you know, that's a huge amount, and, and, and we know we can't expect to get there right away, but there needs to be a plan put in place where uh, the government has to see this as a more priority and start to increase the, uh, uh, the funding. <clears throat> In my experience, I would suspect that the consequences of this are most felt by the students that are at the extremes. They have special needs uh, of some kind and that teachers are forced more to teach to the imaginary middle when uh, you don't have the learning resource teachers and so on. Would that be your experience? Well, you know, actually uh, we think that uh, uh, it, it, it's even broader than that, that definitely uh, the students who are on the extreme end, the students with special needs, we've seen an increase in students with special needs uh, in the last decade, and we've seen the, the funding to support students with special needs go less, so uh, you know, they aren't getting the necessary support and resources that are, are needed. And uh, you know, we also see that the, uh, what's been labeled before the so-called gray area students who uh, need some additional help in a particular area and they're not necessarily getting as much help as they should be uh, getting because we've seen a loss of our uh, specialist teachers mm -hmm. who would work with these students so uh, you know we have students with special needs that are on the rise they're not getting the necessary support though our, our teachers are working as hard as they can to, to meet their needs. I don't see it as uh, uh, something that happens overnight, you know, that the quality of your public schools erodes. I, I see it as a process that takes decades and can be reversed anywhere along the line because the excellent people you attract to the profession will stay with it. They're committed, they, and they're there. But the problem is, can you recruit new people of similar quality or retain the younger people uh, if the profession, the standards of working conditions in the profession are eroded. And, and that is a problem that we're uh, noticing. Uh, you know, we believe that we need to be attracting the youngest, the young, 
the brightest into teaching. We know we would like to keep them. We know that the stats show that uh, a high percentage of teachers uh, leave in their first five years, and uh, that has to be attributed to the uh, working conditions that uh, teachers are facing in their classroom these days, which of course are our students' uh, learning conditions. And, and we also know that another issue in terms of attracting uh, teachers to the profession and keeping in, uh, teachers in the profession is also the uh, salaries of our, our members. And we know that our salaries of our members are probably about eighth across Canada in comparison to other uh, teachers. And so, uh, and which also sh shows uh, the respect uh, that's needed for, for our teachers for the work that they do. Now, some people would say that uh, <clears throat> this is an inherent problem that happens everywhere and all the time. You know, that uh, teachers unions and the governments that they work with are going to be in this polarized relationship. But, uh, of course, the data from PISA and others say that the best school systems, the best nations in the world have highly unionized teacher corps. So in Canada, for example, uh, or in the past in British Columbia, were there times or are there places now where teachers unions and provincial governments work together better with less in the way of strikes and uh, with education seeming to be less of a political football? Well, we know there are experiences uh, in other provinces across Canada. We also know where there's been other experiences that have been really good and then they run into uh, problems and this is, you know, you're experiencing this in Ontario. Uh, we know in Alberta recently when the new Premier, um, Alison Redford, uh, came into power, the first thing she did was restore a $110 million cut uh, to public education. So that just shows uh, in terms of what she uh, prioritized as, as one of the areas that uh, what was important for her and for her government. We see uh, in Saskatchewan, uh, where the government was able to come to an agreement with their uh, teachers, where they recognize the importance of the work that teachers do in the classroom as well as in their uh, communities. And they were able to come to an agreement with the help of a media arbitrator that, that showed that they respect uh, uh, their teachers. And uh, we know in this province in the past where uh, we've had some respectful relationships with uh, government, and this is probably pre-2001 is what we're talking about, where government uh, respected the work of teachers and they came uh, through the BC Teachers Federation and our local teachers union to uh, look for teachers to work on uh, curriculum committees. And, and uh, you know, this is an issue that we've been working tremendously hard with this current government in terms of ensuring that uh, in terms of any kind of education change, you have to come through the representative voice of, uh, of teachers, and that's an important piece because when our teachers sit on uh, ministry curriculum uh, committees, uh, they're not just representing themselves, they're representing all of our members in a particular subject area. Okay, thank you. Okay. We'll be back in a moment. At SFU, I was ready, ready to pursue my dream to become a physiotherapist, which all started back in high school with my passion for athletics. But then I took a health sciences course and discovered that at SFU, you have choices, incredible choices. It opened my eyes to a world of possibilities in global health, possibilities for my future I had never considered but I really struggled with letting go of my first goal. And that's when I found out how much support you get here. Incredible support, so you can really explore all those choices. Think them through and choose the path that's right for you. Faculty and staff paved the way for me and helped me navigate my new path, and I've never looked back. At SFU, you're part of a real community. The faculty and staff know who you are, what your interests are, and they really go out of their way for you. Research projects, conferences, international studies, co-op positions, student leadership. At SFU, you get the best education you could possibly hope for and the most support you could possibly ask for. And now that I've graduated, I'm packing my bags for Oxford to start my master's degree. Here's my plan. I see a need for better bridges between ideas and action in global healthcare. And if I can help build those bridges, that would be a really fantastic thing to do. I'm ready, and if you put your mind to it, you'll be ready too.
Jim, in looking at your background, I noticed that you've been a, a part of many, many negotiations over your career as a union leader. And I thought it would be helpful to those of us who aren't in that room for you to talk about the current negotiations, who's at the table, uh, and whether we should have reason to believe things are headed in the right direction or not, and what kind of factors influence whether those negotiations will succeed. Thanks, Paul. Yes, I have been involved in many rounds of uh, when we used to have local bargaining uh, between 1988 and 1992, and many rounds since we've had provincial bargaining since 1995. And, uh, you know, uh, we're always hopeful, and I, I'm uh, optimistic, and uh, we've just started this round of uh, uh, provincial bargaining again because our uh, contract expires in the end of June 2013. And so we're at the table with the uh, with BCPC, which is the um, uh, employer's representative. Uh, and I think we're off to a good start. Uh, we've had two sessions, and uh, we're building off a, uh, an agreement in committee that we were able to negotiate with uh, the employer back in uh, December, and which was ratified uh, a couple near the end of uh, January by both parties. And, and, and what it does, it, it, it sets the stage of, uh, in, a, in a positive way for this next round of negotiations. It, it, it includes uh, um, an agreement on uh, using a facilitator at the bargaining team, and so we've agreed on a facilitator. It involves a uh, data committee uh, being set up, and there's a data committee right now between us and uh, the employer to deal to see if we can come to an agreement on the actual costs and the data you know where we are in terms of salaries uh, whether you compare individual grids or you compare averages across Canada in terms of where we are in, in class size and, and other areas so I think that's a, a really good start and uh, we you know we've also talked about in terms of trying to keep this bargain uh, at, at the table though we'll still be talking about uh, our advocacy for our students, which in terms of their learning conditions and which we know are our working conditions. And we also settled an, another item in terms of having more issues bargained at the uh, local level between uh, our local unions and local school boards where they can actually uh, deal with uh, kind of personnel uh, issues like Post and Phil. Uh, with the parties that are directly affected by it. So I, I think the, you know, the framework is a good start as we move forward. So you created, <coughs> well, with your bargaining partners, something called a framework. And uh, you obviously feel you have a bargaining partner that you can communicate with and that there's good faith bargaining going on. Uh, we're hoping that uh, right now there's good faith bargaining and we hope that there will be good uh, Faith uh, bargaining. Uh, I think both uh, sides realize that they would like to come to uh, an agreement if that's possible. But we know one of the uh, the conditions for an agreement is having resources <laughs> at the table, and uh, you know, government controls the resources. And uh, uh, the last round of bargaining uh, was a very, uh, I guess, what, what you may confrontational round of bargaining to uh, some extent because uh, there was no resources being provided by government at the table as well as they had an agenda where they wanted to uh, again uh, take things away from our uh, collective agreement and uh, you know that that kind of uh, thing is not on bargaining is about uh, about compromise about both sides being able to discuss the issues that are important and then, and then, then coming to an agreement without interference. So if, if we're going to have a successful round of bargaining, which we're hoping for, and I know the other side is hoping for, then we know that there has to be resources provided and that the employer actually has an ability to come to an agreement with us. But uh, you know that will depend on government because the employer represents government to not only trustees. Well, it, I'm surprised that there isn't that kind of communication going on. Uh, it makes it appear that uh, it's an obstacle to our resolving our differences among the different groups if they're not meeting in various forums and settings to communicate. How do you think all this impacts on the public's view of the BCTF? Uh, I think you and the organization monitor this. <clears throat> how, how confident are you that the public 
is uh, getting the information they need to make a, an informed decision about their support for the BCTF. Well, I think the uh, you know the public uh, has been getting the information in terms of some of the major issues facing us, and that's class size, uh, class composition. We know that the public supports uh, having uh, lower class sizes, uh, more support for students. We know that the uh, public. Uh, believes that the current system by this government is underfunded, that we need more funding and more resources put uh, back uh, into public education. And so we know uh, the public uh, knows this and you know I think that's a result of the advocacy that we've been uh, doing in these uh, areas. Uh, you know, we also know that the, uh, the, the public is probably is also tired of uh, the strife between uh, government and, uh, and uh, you know, the BC Teachers Federation. And, uh, the, you know, they would like to see uh, relationships uh, uh, improve. And, uh, you know, we're always uh, about wanting to uh, meet with government and, and deal with the uh, issues. And, uh, you know, we look forward uh, in, into the future. Um, pending the results of an election in terms of meeting with government um, a, 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 as an equal in terms of um, you know policy decisions on education involving us in uh, in a real way uh, in any kind of discussions on uh, education change for people who want to be informed about education do you have any recommendations on where they can go in media or elsewhere uh, to get accurate and balanced information? Well, we, we think that they can get uh, uh, information from uh, our website uh, at the BCTF, www.bctf.ca. We do have a section for the public and the parents, um, you know, and, and we think that uh, the information we provide uh, is accurate as, as we can make it because we use it in terms of we look at stats that are produced. Uh, we're also talking about experiences of teachers in the classroom working with, with students. Uh, we are the professionals uh, in the classroom. And so I think that that's one area, and I'm sure there's probably other um, areas out there in, in the web where uh, uh, parents and the public can get information. They can get information from uh, democratically elected uh, trustees uh, where they exist in most part across this province except for one place right now. <laughs> so I think there are areas where uh, the public can get information. I mean, talk to the classroom teacher about what's actually happening in a school. Visit a school. Well, I, uh, I certainly advocate for that. Yes, visiting the schools of BC has been a privilege and an inspiration to me. <clears throat> and I do agree with you that I think the public would like a change in tone around public education. It's been at the center of controversy for too long, and I hope that uh, in the near future we can reach that kind of accommodation. Thank you for being with us today, Jim. Oh, it's my pleasure, Paul. Thank you very much. We'll be back in a moment. When I hear the debates over testing and ranking schools, I feel like I'm in a fantasy land. The debate assumes that we know how to put a number on the quality of one's education. It goes like this. A test score puts a number on the educative value of school experience. Then that number is used to make quality judgments about teaching and schools and learning. Or a think tank takes the raw test numbers and then imposes a black box of arbitrary formulas on the numbers to rank our schools. And the media promote the rankings. A number drawn from a standardized test of academic knowledge can accurately size up a slice of educational achievement, a number that is by its design narrow in its scope and intentionally ignoring every other aspect of school life. Every inspiration, every good or bad feeling, all the interests that learning may have brought, all the lifelong motivation, all the higher order thinking, all the thinking outside the box. The only other institution that gets quality evaluated in this way is sports which are meant to be taken as entertainment. No serious, non-virtual profession or enterprise would be evaluated with such methods. We use this approach in sports because it provides an imaginary certitude that is a change in relief from real life. It's for fun. But real life doesn't reveal itself in blacks and whites or beginnings and endings. It's ongoing. It's incremental. 
It's shaded, ambiguous, unpredictable, elusive, transformational. We want some dreaming in education about what might be. We want to define education in terms of precision, but also with attention to its openness to change, its enthusiasm, its questioning of authority, and the values it inculcates. You don't want to judge a student or teacher or rank a school without including these factors. You know the cliche, you teach what you test. This means that accountability methods eventually drive the entire process. If you evaluate by a certain narrow standard, such as test scores, you will eventually restructure school to give highest priority only to that outcome. Nobody wants those schools. Why are we treating our public schools as if they were sports teams? Why are we treating them with such a lack of seriousness? I called a fantasy land. I'm trying to be polite in my choice of words. Thank you for thinking about Your Education Matters. Visit our archive at youreducationmatters.ca.